I'd like to personally welcome you all to the MedRhythms video cast series. And this is a monthly series where we'll be taking and talking to world experts in the field of neurology, research, rehabilitation, and music, and discussing all things from digital therapeutics to music and neuroscience and rehabilitation. Each month, we feature a new expert who will provide valuable insight into these important topics. The show is hosted by me, Brian Harris, the co-founder and CEO of MedRhythms a digital therapeutics company focusing at the intersection of neuroscience, technology, and music to build interventions that transform the lives of those living with neurologic injury or disease. If you'd like to learn more about MedRhythms, please visit our website at www.medrhythms.com. I hope that you find today's episode interesting, meaningful, and compelling, and I believe that you will. Today, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Kirk Erickson. Dr. Erickson is currently the director and principal investigator of the Brain Aging and Cognitive Health Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh and Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition. Dr. Erickson studies the impact of physical activity and obesity on brain health across the lifespan. This research has resulted in more than 240 published articles and 15 book chapters. Dr. Erickson's research has been funded by numerous awards and grants from the NIH, the Alzheimer's Association, and other organizations. He received a Distinguished Scientist Award by Murdoch University in Australia in 2018. Dr. Erickson was a member of the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee and chair of the Brain Health Subcommittee charged with developing the second edition of the Physical Health Guidelines for Americans. His research has been featured in a long list of print, radio, and electronic media, including the New York Times, CNN, BBC News, NPR, Time, and the Wall Street Journal. Welcome, Kirk. It's an honor to have you with us today. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's really an honor to be here. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think just to get started, could you just tell us a bit more about the Brain Aging and Cognitive Health Laboratory that you run and your specific role there? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I oversee a large team. About, uh, we have about 40 or so people uh, that, uh, that are involved, everyone from undergraduate students to graduate students, postdocs, um, assistant professors, part of the team doing, doing research. And our focus is all on how does physical activity influence brain health and function? And then also we're asking questions about how can we understand the, the mechanisms of the brain and how those, those processes and mechanisms actually predict long-term adherence to physical activity behaviors. So all of this goes hand in hand with, with, uh, with one another. And we um, are currently looking at uh, and examining uh, these, um, these associations across numerous populations and age groups. Amazing. Can you talk to us a bit about some of the current studies that you have going on? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, really exciting. Uh, re uh, some really exciting work that we've got going on right now that are that are uh, uh, kind of part way through the studies, and and uh, it takes a long time to do any of this work, right? So it's it takes several years, and uh, these studies typically are done in a very similar way as what you might consider to be a, like a pharmace traditional pharmaceutical type of trial. That is, they're randomized clinical trials. We randomly assign people to either our physical activity group or to some control group. And the idea is then uh, those individuals are the, the demographic and other aspects, individual differences are distributed evenly across those two groups. And then when we systematically increase the amount of physical activity in the physical activity the treatment group, we can then determine, we can, be, we can make stronger causal inferences about the impact of physical activity on various endpoints, including brain outcomes and cognitive outcomes, mood, you can think about depression, anxiety, to memory function. But we're also trying to, we also use um, really advanced and more sophisticated neuroimaging techniques to really get into the brain, right? Peel back the skull a bit and really dig into the brain and examine how this physical activity actually alter the functioning of the brain, the size of different brain regions, the morphology, the structure, uh, the connections and the way it's communicating. And so this is what we're really trying to do and even trying to get even down even deeper in, into the brain, trying to examine various molecular pathways using different technologies now. So a lot of, a, there's been a, a lot of progress in this field and we're trying to use this technology in a number of different studies. One of them is a large clinical trial, multiple sites, 
in which we're trying to examine and, and trying to make more definitive conclusions about the dose of exercise or physical activity that might be needed. This is really critically important because we all know that physical activity is beneficial, it's good, um, but uh, we don't know how much is actually needed to modify our brain. And this is, a, this is a really critical question from a prescriptive standpoint. So imagine a medication. You go into a physician and uh, your physician um, uh, tells you you should take this medication, but that physician doesn't tell you how much you should take, how frequently you should take it, <laughs> what this potential side effects or drawbacks are, what the mechanisms are, so uh, or how long you need to take it. Is this something I need to be taking for a month or two months or for the rest of my life? And, and so, you know, such an absurd scenario is, is essentially where we're finding the field of physical activity right now. Everyone knows that a prescription of physical activity is important, but how much do you need to get in order, in order to modify the brain is remains an unanswered question. So we're trying to more closely examine the dose response nature, looking at intensity, frequency, volume of activity, um, and, and examine the, the differential impact of these various aspects of the dose on our outcomes, which are cognitive and brain outcomes. So that's one study uh, that we're really excited about. Um, and that's, um, probably has about another year and a half to two years. So I would expect maybe in about two years, we'll have some interesting findings. Three years, we'll have some interesting findings from that. Another really exciting one uh, is a project called REACT. Um, and it's called uh, the Rhythm Experience in Africana Culture Trial. And the whole idea behind this is um, there's, there's, there's two driving factors. One is that um, many people don't like the word exercise, mm -hmm. right? It, it has, a, it has a, a connotation with it that a lot of people, some people it really resonates with and other people it doesn't. Uh, they just don't like the term and it just, they, they get pulled away. But if we ask them to go dancing, then maybe their attitudes and their thoughts differ and change. And so what this is doing, this trial, is it's trying to frame physical activity in a different way with different messaging. In fact, in all of our, in all of our advertising, we don't use the term exercise and we don't use the term physical activity. It is dancing that we're targeting. And, uh, and so we're hoping to engage people in a different way uh, than what we have traditionally done with our exercise, traditional exercise studies. And uh, the idea here is that dancing is a form of physical activity. And it also provides um, a number of other important aspects to brain health. It gets you socially engaged. Um, there's skill and, uh, and a cognitive and a memory component that, that, uh, that needs to be engaged. So we're taking people who are between 60 and 80 years of age, getting them exercising through dancing, getting them active, getting them together in these social groups. And obviously this was affected by COVID, um, but, uh, but we're working through all that. And so this is another exciting one. And, and the other avenue here is that, um, that unfortunately we have massive health disparities uh, around our country in a number of areas and Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment is one of these areas. We know that individuals that identify as black or African-American tend to have greater rates of Alzheimer's disease. We still don't really understand why that is happening. And uh, the clinical trials often don't distinguish and, and allow us to be able to separate out whether individuals that are, are African American respond more to certain interventions. And so for this reason, also, we are specifically targeting older African Americans in this particular study. Amazing. Uh, very exciting stuff there. And the loss to unpack, which we're going to unpack a bit, um, as we, you know, as a sort of first uh, place to start, can you tell us, you know, what made you want to uh, really look at this as an area of, of research specifically, and why is it important? You know, it's very uh, exciting to hear you talk about dosing, prescripting uh, exercise, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about those results that you you, you uh, have found later on. But what made you even get into this area, and why is it an important area for the, the world at large? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question because um, when uh, a lot of times when we think of exercising the brain, 
we think of intellectual activities. Um, uh, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, reading a, a intellectually engaging book or magazine or newspaper. And of course, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be uh, diminishing the potential impacts of those types of things, especially lifelong learning. I think it's very, very important. But um, you know, when I was a uh, back when I was in graduate school and, and going through postdocs and my my educational training, I was very interested in brain plasticity, the potential that the brain has to modify, be modified, and to and to modify itself actually. Um, with environmental stimulation, right? So this was very interesting to me. And in fact, every day, every day that we are engaging with the world, our brain is changing. We're forgetting some things and we're remembering other things. We're constantly being affected by our environment. And when we say our environment and we are being affected, I mean the brain, right? The brain is essentially who we are, how we identify ourselves. And so, um, so when we know that the brain is changing, the brain is plastic, how do we capitalize on that plasticity? How do we, how do we um, what, are the, what are the most efficient and effective ways of keeping the brain active and optimizing it uh, throughout the lifespan? And could we, if we target those, and if we, if we identify some of those factors that really enhance brain plasticity, then could it be possible that we could leverage some of those procedures and processes for mitigating some of the some neurological illnesses, uh, either the risk of, of experiencing those neurologic and psychiatric conditions, or even as a treatment. And so this is where physical activity started to emerge. Physical activity has been examined in the context of animal studies for many years. And, uh, and so we had a lot of information from animal studies um, that we could use as a, as a bit of a springboard for then um, starting to pursue this in, in humans. And, uh, and so this is really kind of where I came in. And, and in fact, some of my early work was kind of comparing more cognitive training versus physical training. And the differences that I found were really quite striking and physical activity really had a very big, broad effect on the brain in a way that cognitive training didn't. Cognitive training was very specific. And so I could, as I looked at the data, I could not ignore the profound and massive impact of physical activity on the brain. Amazing, amazing. It's so exciting. And I think, you know, as, as most people who are probably watching this, and we have folks that are, um, uh, you know, patients, caregivers, clinicians, researchers um, that are, are, are watching this episode, and many folks may look at exercise and say, yeah, it's something that this sort of a, it's something that's fun to do. Maybe it's not so fun to do. We generally understand the health benefits, right? Everybody right. knows that if we exercise, we're probably more healthy than if we don't, right? right? But what have you found in your research? What are the actual cognitive impacts of, uh, of uh, physical activity? So, you know, one of the things that we've, we found is that um, we can say quite conclusively now that participating in exercise influences the brain. That's no longer the argument. As I was mentioning earlier, what we're arguing and what we're de debating about now is how much do you need, what frequency, what types, how much. And, and so these are, this is where the, the, the field is at this point. So what we can say and what we've learned is that uh, physical activity unequivocally positively influences brain function across the lifespan. Where we see some of the bigger effects are uh, right now, um, from what we have available right now, children, we see effects in children. In developmental stages, as the brain is starting to form, um, it's really important to get your kids out there being physically active. And we don't, we don't call it exercise when you're a kid, right? It's playing. It's playing games. It's playing sports. It's playing outside. It's playtime. And so that's what we need to get our kids doing because it clearly has an influence on cognitive function, brain development, academic achievement, and so on. As we look throughout the lifespan, older adults, late adulthood, it's so important. We see impact of, of being physically active on memory function, uh, executive function. We see it impact on sleep, uh, sleep behavior, sleep efficiency, uh, mood, 
uh, measurements of anxiety and stress. So all of these, all of these aspects of mental health and, and, and brain health are clearly affected by engaging in physical activity. And so, um, so we are very confident that all of, these, all of these areas are affected. Now, there's also been a lot of research in some uh, clinical conditions. Individuals with neurologic or psychiatric conditions might also show benefit. In fact, there's some, some indications that some individuals um, with, with uh, neurologic or psychiatric conditions might even benefit just as much, if not more, uh, from engaging in physical activity. Um, so all of this is, is, is very, uh, very well established. And, and again, we can still debate about the subtleties, but I think there's enough data across mood, anxiety, and, and cognition that we can be quite conclusive <laughs> that all these things are affected. Yeah, you know, especially if you look at the breadth of research, even over the last five to 10 years, and how much that's expanded um, and become sort of more even mainstream knowledge about this connection between movement, exercise, cognition, et cetera. Now, let's get a little bit more technical about some of this, uh, some of this stuff. So as you think about it, a lot of the work that you do focuses around neuroimaging. Yeah. What type of neuroimaging are you doing? And can you explain, you know, maybe to the more lay people that may be watching what these different types of neuroimaging uh, are and why you chose that for the specific studies that you've been looking at? Sure, yeah. Um, we, we have been predominantly looking at using two neuroimaging techniques, but, um, but one of them is is um, very, shall we say, flexible um, in the types of data that it can be that that we can collect. And so everyone, is, or not may, maybe not everyone, but many people are very familiar with magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. It's very common in clinics, hospitals, and 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 uh, many other uh, centers around around the world. Um, magnetic resonance imaging, um, uh, we can use this in. in tweak and change some of the parameters in, in some very subtle ways to change the types of images that get collected. So you can collect your very traditional, just brain image and MRI is, is used for soft tissues. And so like uh, CT scans and x-rays, we aren't gonna use those for uh, examining the brain, but magnetic resonance imaging is specific for soft tissues. So when you're going in for a brain scan, usually you are going to get something like an MRI. So we can use that. We get that MRI, just a traditional MRI image uh, of your brain, structural image, what we refer to as just a structural, structural image. And then we can, but we can take that data, that image and use it as data and then separate it, segment it out and, and, and identify, um, for example, um, one particular area and examine how that area changes over the course of the lifespan and how it changes as a function of some treatment, like engaging in an exercise intervention. Now, some of these brain areas, we have a very good sense of what they do, what their functions are, and how, those, uh, how these brain regions change with damage or disease or pathology. And so using this technology, we can become actually, we can get very, very precise information about exercise or physical activity changes the morphology, the structure, the size of this particular brain area in a way, in a positive way that is likely then to influence their risk for these other types of conditions or psychiatric conditions, neurologic illnesses, and so on. We, we can also get information on white matter. And um, basically when we have, when you have multiple brain areas that are active and, and trying to coordinate with one another, um, brain area X might be trying to communicate with brain area Y. And the way it does that are through um, what, what's referred to as white matter. And the white matter is basically like the axon or the highways of the brain, they're axons. And so they're the highways of the brain, allowing signals to communicate, uh, uh, allowing brain areas to communicate with one another. And so we're now able to use the same MRI machine to get very detailed and precise information about the fibers, these highways of the brain that allow regions to communicate with one another. And so using this information as well, we're able to not just examine the brain areas themselves, but essentially how many potholes are in the roads that allow uh, these areas to communicate. The more potholes there are, um, that is going to influence your, the ability for these areas to communicate. And the question here is, 
could exercise, could physical activity be a good way of basically patching over some of those potholes and allowing these areas to communicate more efficiently. So we're able to use this technology in this, in this way. Uh, amazing. I like the analogy to potholes. Find the potholes and then figure out how to fill the potholes, right? Like, isn't that what we're trying to do in medicine in general? Is just find the potholes, figure out how to, to fill them. So I love that. Um, and it's interesting because, um, and I think maybe to, to keep double clicking and, and sort of zooming in a little bit more, when we first met, uh, you and I, uh, I was at uh, the American Congress of Rehab Medicine. Um, you had uh, given a, a fantastic plenary uh, presentation to, I think, a couple of thousand people that were there in the, in the audience listening about this connection between exercise and, and cognition, which was absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that I wasn't aware of before then, uh, but you had done some research in the years prior, was really specifically looking at the hippocampus and the, the, the impact of uh, physical activity on hippocampal volume. Um, could you first explain what the hippocampus is and what it does? Um, and then uh, what was the relevance of the, you, you know, you've done a number of research uh, uh, studies around this area. What have you found about that correlation? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, a good question. And, and we've learned a lot about, uh, about the hippocampus, what it's, what it's doing and how it responds to exercise. So the hippocampus, it's a fairly small structure um, sitting essentially behind your ears, towards the middle of your brain. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a structure that is critically involved in memory formation. So um, as we get older, unfortunately, we see some deterioration, some decay of this structure. And we think that that's uh, partly contributing to some of the memory changes that happen with, uh, with age. As we get older, we start seeing memory deficits and that's partly related to the shrinking of the size of this particular structure. And so um, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very important structure. And, and in fact, uh, even furthering uh, the topic on aging, um, when we, we know that when the hippocampus reaches a certain level of decay, that's when we start seeing really severe memory impairments, for an example, like in Alzheimer's disease. And so Alzheimer's disease is very, very closely linked to the size and functioning of this structure that is called the hippocampus. Now, um, the hippocampus is also really involved in a lot of other neurologic and psychiatric illnesses, but it's really, um, I think its role in Alzheimer's disease and just age-related memory problems and memory decline is very, very well established. So um, for many years uh, in rodent studies and rodents, um, it's very easy to get uh, uh, in a rodent study to put a, a, a rat into a cage and give them access to a running wheel, kind of like how many of us had hamsters when we were young and the hamster just got on the running wheel and ran, right? Same, same kind of idea. And so we're able to give some animals running wheels and some animals um, don't get access to running wheels. And then we clearly, clearly uh, we, we can examine their brains and this research has very clearly indicated that uh, for many years that access to a running wheel and running on that running wheel is very closely um, associated with improvements in the functioning of the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So we went into this in humans thinking like, okay, there's all of this massive literature in rodents and in animals indicating that exercise is so good for this structure. So let's take a close look at this structure. And what we, what we ended up finding was that 12 months only, I mean, 12 months sound, might sound like a long time, but really it's not that long, right? 12 months of just getting physically active about three times a week was a sufficient amount of activity to actually increase the size of this structure in older individuals that are typically showing decline and decay of this structure over time. And so you can think about that 12 months of physical activity was like reversing the aging clock on this structure by about one to two years. So that's quite, quite an impressive uh, finding. Yes. So, and just to, I think, get to the nuts and bolts of this, right? So we think about physical activity, uh, quite literally changed anatomical structure of the brain, specifically hippocampus, which is important for memory, age-related memory, these types of things. Exactly. That's Remarkable. exactly right. 
It's remarkable. It's, it's remarkable. absolutely remarkable. And, and it's, I, and I want to throw in that it's, um, it's something that pharmaceutical trials have been trying to demonstrate for many, many years. Right. And despite our continued hope that some pharmaceutical could develop that could have the same effect, it's very clear that physical activity has such an impact, a clear impact on the size of these structures that typically are decaying with age. Amazing, amazing. What about um, thinking about folks that may have had some sort of neurologic injury or disease, so stroke or a traumatic brain injury or Parkinson's or MS, you know, these types of uh, uh, injuries and disease states, is there an application for this, for those um, type of diagnoses and populations as well? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and as I was alluding to earlier, there's some evidence in, in many of these conditions that individuals that remain physically active uh, throughout their life have a reduced risk of developing some of these conditions um, in, in the first place. So more of a prevention mm -hmm. perspective. But then turning the wheel a bit, thinking about it as a therapeutic, as a treatment. Um, and, and there's a growing amount of data available indicating that um, many individuals who experience stroke, uh, MS, Parkinson's disease, it's not just some of their motor abilities, it's also cognitive functions, memory functions, and other uh, mood and anxiety and other things that are, are very clearly affected by the brain damage that they've experienced or the neurologic illness or the pathology that, is, that, that they're experiencing and, and fighting. Um, and so what's, what's quite clear from a lot of this is that, there's, uh, that there's, there's clear evidence that physical activity engaging in exercise is, is very, very useful for influencing many of these outcomes. Now, I would say for some of them, uh, some of these conditions, we still need more data um, to be very, to be more definitive. Um, as you know, um, it's, these studies take a long time to do, unfortunately. And so we need, I think we need more data to be definitive. But if I had to, if I, if, if being a, if I, if I, w if I was a clinician, um, and if I was, if I was uh, talking to a patient and a patient with um, multiple sclerosis was asking me whether uh, physical activity could be beneficial for some cognitive changes that they they might be experiencing. I would say absolutely. Um, there there's growing amount of evidence that it could be beneficial. I don't want to hang my hat on it's absolutely a perfect therapy that will solve all your problems. But um, I think the the benefits uh, outweigh the risks in this case. Amazing. Um, and you know it's interesting to think about when you think about the benefit risk ratio of, you know, what are side effects, right? You know, it right. could be fatigue, things like that. You obviously don't want to overdo it, but right. it's fairly quote unquote benign intervention in, in, in that way. Right. Um, so for some of these studies, you know, when you think about ex the term exercise or physical activity, how are you defining that for these, um, for these studies? Like, I know you're, you're working on dosing studies now to really figure out how do we prescribe this, but what ha have you looked at to date as that the right amount? So, you know, the, it's, a, it's a very good question, and uh, because people define physical activity and exercise behaviors in different ways. So the way that we've been, we've been uh, thinking about it and talking about it is, is um, we want to make sure that we're getting people's heart rate up into a particular zone. And many people who are familiar with uh, modern day treadmills and other pieces of equipment, quite often they will have heart rate zones on, uh, on the pieces of equipment, right? Like what are you trying to target uh, as your heart rate zone given the age and your current fitness levels and things like that. And that's kind of what we're trying to do. And the whole idea is, is that we wanna get um, you up uh, into a moderate, at least a moderate intensity level of activity. And to put it in a more general frame, we want uh, you to be able to be enough out of breath that uh, you could still talk a bit, but you wouldn't be able to sing a song. Mm. And, um, and so that's, that's probably gonna be at a moderate intensity and more vigorous intensity could have some benefits as well. And there you might have more challenges actually carrying out a conversation. You might be too out of breath 
and, and need some time to, to settle down and cool off before you can really have a conversation. And so that's at the intensity level. And then we're trying to achieve about 150 minutes per week or bring people up. A lot of people are not getting anything remotely like that right now. And we're trying to bring them up to about 150 minutes per week. And there's some reasons why we're choosing 150. 150 minutes per week at this level, this intensity has been shown to improve um, a number of health endpoints, cardiovascular, uh, type two diabetes, metabolic um, outcomes, uh, can all, can all uh, benefit from this level of activity. And so we have some evidence that 150 minutes at this level of intensity would be, could be beneficial. And so that's part of the reason why we're, we're starting to target that. But then, as I mentioned earlier, we need a lot more information about dose um, to, to really be uh, confirming that. That's very, it's very interesting. And if we break that down, uh, 150 minutes a week, if you do it five days a week is 30 minutes during the five days or 20 minutes during the seven days, roughly. So it's a small piece of time each day could have a significant impact in the long term. Exactly, exactly. And we've, we're starting to also look at different uh, modes of activity. So, you know, some people prefer going to the pool uh, than walking and that's perfectly, seems to be perfectly fine. Um, you know, what, what's more important is the frequency of the activity and the intensity and amount that you're doing per week. But, uh, you know, a brisk walk um, is, is going to have that impact. And, um, or some people like to play tennis and that's what, you know, that's what they, they prefer to do. So it doesn't seem to be as much about the mode. Although, like I said, we need a lot more work on, on sure. figuring out some of these answers to these questions. Sure. And we, you know, if we use that uh, thinking about the mode, the transition and, and, and talk a little bit about the REACT study, because I'd like to get your, your perspective there and, and looking at dance and obviously as a, music and movement company uh, that we are at MedRhythms, this is fascinating to me. Um, and I think that I have my own clinical and sort of scientific hypothesis about why these things may work. Um, is there a reason why you think dance may be helpful? Is it just motivation? Is there something else about the music that could be happening that could be driving these results? Do you expect to see the same results as just, I say just walking, uh, but walking without music versus dance, do you expect to see more enhanced results? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 uh, I absolutely believe that there are health benefits associated with music. Um, and, you know, you can think about music uh, uh, separately as, as um, um, a, a separate way of, of influencing brain and cognition and mood. Um, but you can also think of it as a way of getting people to move. Um, and, um, and, I think that there's still a lot to learn about exactly what the mechanisms of, of all of these benefits are, but I think that there's enough evidence out there to be really confident with some of these statements. Um, and so part of, part of my idea here is that, um, is motivational, like you said, I think that uh, dance is a different way of motivating people to become active and to stay active. Um, if you are, one of the things that we know is, for an example, like, like personally, I do not like to swim. So despite me knowing, despite me knowing all of the benefits of swimming, I also know that if I try to force myself to go to the pool several days a week, doing something that I'm not enjoying, I'm not going to really continue to do it for very long. And so um, part of the, part of what we're hoping to achieve here is not just a study, a single study where we we have a starting point and a stopping point, but I'm really trying to do something that's going to influence somebody's long-term behavior, that they can become active in ways in which they, for, with activities that they can really enjoy doing. And so we're trying to make this a really enjoyable activity and, and keep them going. And in fact, many of our participants uh, do not, after the, it's a six month trial, at six months when they're supposed to be leaving the study, they do not want to finish. They want to just keep going. And this is, this is exactly what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to influence this behavior. So I do think that, that having this dance and having the music component is a big part of the motivation. But I also think that having that musical component um, and that um, the, and even separately from the physical activity component, that musical component could have, it could have some added benefits on top of the movement even. 
And so um, I'm very interested in, in examining and comparing the results from this trial to some of our other trials in which we just have people walking on a treadmill, essentially. They're getting movement, they're getting mobility, but they're not listening to music. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating sort of uh, interaction there because uh, you at the core of it, um, as you said, from a motivation perspective, if people don't engage in something, there will be no help, benefits to that. You know, just like if somebody doesn't take a drug, they won't get the impacts of the drug. If somebody doesn't engage in the physical activity, there will be no uh, benefits of that. So we need to find interventions that are at their core motivating. And I think from, uh, from our perspective at MedRhythms, uh, much of what we do is focused on this interaction of specifically rhythm to improve movement. And in our case, we're really focused on walking. So how can we use rhythm to engage the motor system to improve the way that people walk? Which then begs the question that if we can actually see improvement in functional outcomes related to walking, and improved walking could potentially lead to cognition, is there actually something that's more uh, compelling about the actual sort of underlying mechanism of auditory motor entrainment using rhythm to drive movement that also applies to dance that right. could be a reason why these are enhanced outcomes. Um, you know, we've seen in some of our early data as well that um, movement to music or specifically walking to, to music improves metabolic outcomes. Um, so it actually allows you to expend less energy and you must, you sort of have to wonder that if, if that's the case, does that mean that you could actually do more physical activity if you're expending less energy while you're doing the activity? Exactly. So exactly. Lots of things to lots of things for us to study together, Kurt. Exactly, exactly. It's such a it's such an exciting area. And, and, and you know what you just mentioned in our pilot study uh, of this for this for this uh, the dance study, the pilot uh, early uh, portion of the of the study, we actually found um, weight loss. Um, in our participants. So six months of, of dancing, um, we found signi significant patterns of weight loss. And that's different than a lot of our other walking studies and things where we, we, see, we might see some changes in body composition, but we don't really uh, find, um, it's not the type of intervention where you typically see significant weight loss. So that was exciting as a, as a, as a part of the dance study that uh, we found such an effect. Very interesting. Um, it's, it's very interesting in this area as we think about the, such the uh, compelling results that you're seeing. And I think you're taking such a unique uh, sort of approach in pioneering this research, really looking at, at neuroimaging specifically, not just functional outcomes, but really looking at underlying uh, morphology and, and uh, aspects of the brain to think about that question of how could it also be preventative as well as a treatment mechanism, right? And that's where I think there's so much you know, future potential here. Um, in my how time flies, we've now, we're now coming up on 35 to 40 minutes, and this has just been an, an amazing conversation. But um, one of the things that I want to ask that I ask all of the uh, guests that we've had on the show um, is sort of the last question is, you know, to you and based upon your experience, what does the future of research in this area look like? You know, I think that the future of research in this in this particular area is going in a few different directions. One is it's becoming more um, there is a is a focus on on therapeutics. Um, how many populations could actually benefit from this? And and even we've been focusing here on neurologic and psychiatric illness, but but there's a lot of conditions and a lot of illnesses that show that are not that are not defined by neurologic and psychiatric conditions, but still those are affected. So for an example, my colleague and I are, are studying breast cancer. We know that breast cancer and cancer treatments often have impact on many mental, mental health, the cognitive and brain health outcomes. So here the question is, is, is could engaging in exercise improve some of those uh, cognitive and brain outcomes that are affected by breast cancer. And so I, I really see the area branching off here and, and really um, thinking from a therapeutic perspective, how can we use physical activity across all of these populations um, in a way that can really benefit their treatment uh, and, and, and other many other outcomes. The other, other avenues that I see are um, translating this. Uh, so um, um, once we have some idea that physical activity could really be beneficial for academic achievement and mental health outcomes, depressive symptoms, cognitive function in, in older populations, how do we 
get people more active utilizing this technology? Can we, can we convince people? Can this information be, you know, another, another point that brings people in and says, you know what, my mom suffered from Alzheimer's disease. I saw what she went through. I want to do whatever I can to prevent that. And if getting phys more physically active is something that uh, could be beneficial, then that might be the, one of the driving forces to keep people more active. So we're, we're, we're really kind of focusing on some of these more translation policy and recommendation um, uh, approaches as well. Well, I applaud you for the work that you're doing, Kirk. So thank you for that. It's important work and uh, uh, very, uh, very much impactful and proves to be impactful now and will continue to be in the future. So I appreciate that very much. And thank you for being here today and for your perspective. Um, it's an honor to have you and also an honor to have you um, as part of the Medellin Scientific Advisory Board on aging, really focusing on this interaction and into cognition. And I am greatly looking forward to, to uh, maybe answering some of these scientific hypotheses that we have together at some point in, uh, in the near future. So thank you very much for being here. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's been really, really wonderful. And, and uh, it's, it's really an honor, honor for me to work with you as well. It's great. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. And um, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, I encourage you to keep an eye out for our next episode in August, uh, where the guest will be announced very soon. As a reminder, if you want to watch this episode again, um, or you'd like to learn about uh, MedRhythms, you can visit our website at www.medrhythms.com. And thanks again for tuning in.